Men hur då klarade du då att reda till dem? Ja, det är men att vi filmer. Ja, till vilket formål da? Da har jeg skrevet ut. Da må jeg nesten hanke inn medieavdelingen her. Informert samtykke til skjema. Ja. Ja, ok. Men skal ikke jeg da skrive det på et skjema med informert samtykke? Det har jeg hørt. Gjerne det. Det går fint. Ok. Vi vil ikke legge begrensninger på din utfoldelse. Så hvis det er bedre å ta det uten, så tar vi det. Nei da, det er ikke noe problem. Det er ikke noe å skylde. Det er det man alltid sier når man har noe å skylde. Vi burde probably gjøre dette på engelsk. Det er en stor plass å ha deg her. Professor Thomas Silan Eriksen, som du alle vet, han var her denne morgen og diskuterer Nils Shias draft PhD dissertation. That was a very constructive uh, discussion. Now we're going to uh, learn about uh, your new big project on a big topic, namely accelerated change. Um, uh, with that, I leave it to you. Uh, we'll go on for 40 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion. Yeah. Oh, please. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Jakob, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come here, and uh, it's also always a pleasure to be able to talk about something which I think is both, uh, I mean, important and intellectually challenging and, and difficult and necessary. Um, so, um, I'm going to introduce my uh, um, research project, or rather, it's not just mine, but I'm the PI, as they say in Brussels, the principal investigator, okay, and we have a group of people, and we're trying to expand that group a little bit by getting some new uh, scholars in to do research in particular sites. Um, and the, uh, the reason, I'll say a little bit about the reason why I'm doing this before I say what it is, is that uh, ethnography, social anthropological, uh, ethnographic, empirical material, is really sort of, it's high octane uh, empirical material. It's very high quality. The only problem uh, with the ethnographic material is that it can get a little bit nearsighted, sometimes, short-sighted sometimes, okay? Myopic. Uh, you might say that there are several kinds of social scientists. Some of them, they circle the planet in a helicopter with a pair of binoculars, okay? And then when they land, I mean, they, they make nice, you know, tables and diagrams and uh, graphs and, uh, and, uh, and very short and succinct articles, okay, as a result. Whereas the other kind of, sort of typical kind of social scientist is the kind who crawls around on all fours with a magnifying glass. Um, and obviously, I mean, the anthropologists belong to the latter category. And one of the challenges we have in thinking about understanding the world, the current world, is how to make those two people speak to each other, as it were, the guy in the helicopter and the one crawling around on all fours. There is a huge literature on globalization, an enormous literature on globalization. And some of this literature it's quite popular, it's widely read. Some of it is even politically influential. <coughs> it was rumored that Bill Clinton had read Benjamin Barber's book, Jihad versus Mac World, for example. So uh, it has an impact. Some of these books are available in airport bookshops. <coughs> it's a book by Thomas Friedman called The World is Flat, for example, a few years ago. It was a major bestseller, translated into lots of languages, uh, and uh, had, had an impact on the way uh, the global middle classes uh, think about globalization. And there is a more scholarly literature of the same kind, uh, Manuel Castells, uh, The Information Age, three-volume book, first published in the late 1990s, has been updated a few times, which also purports to give a, a real sort of overview of the world at the turn of the millennium. All of these uh, books, and many others I could have mentioned, um, they leave the anthropologists feeling slightly unsatisfied, okay? Because anthropologists have a sort of peculiar way of trying to understand the world. 
You like the ambition. Sometimes you like the writing. Entertaining, engaging, enlightening. But there is something missing. Uh, and uh, in the Wheaton, we always say about certain football players that, I don't know how to translate this in English, maybe some can. Han er god på store flater. He's good on a large sort of, he has a good overview, but he's, he's not very good in the close encounter, okay? The close encounter, you know. I mean, uh, Robin van Persie. He, he's the anthropologist of, of English football. Uh, you know, he can, he can receive the ball, and there are four defenders around him, and somehow he manages to turn around and shoot. And usually it's a goal, at least half the time it's a goal, it's, which is a fantastic skill. And the anthropologists are a bit like that, you know. So these people, they're really good, and the, they, they have a very good overview. But the moment someone like Castells begins to write about identity, he beca his language becomes much sloppier, it's full of cliches, it's, he has very, very general descriptions. He doesn't really understand what is going on in, in local uh, life worlds. So that's, that's one body of literature on globalization. And uh, I'm not dismissive of it. I'm just saying that there is something lacking. Then you have the other, seen from the anthropological point of view, the anthropological literature on globalization, which tends to focus on usually one place, but shows how the local is interweaved with the global, and in fact how the global is always expressed through the local, sometimes in very paradoxical ways, because local worlds are unique and they differ from each other. So that, as we spoke briefly about it, in fact, before lunch today, when we discussed Nils' uh, um, PhD, bureaucracies may look the same around the world, but they're very different, because in such certain African countries, I mean, a bureaucracy can be part of a kinship organization, for example. And uh, it, may, it may be, in fact, uh, functioning a, a, along very different principles from what we used to. But that's the, you know, the typical anthropological take on globalization is that we go into this place and we see how local forces contribute to sort of shaping people's priorities, life worlds, and how they react, resist, and respond uh, to uh, the global processes. Uh, so what we're trying to do in um, this project that I'm about to introduce, okay, is to try to combine these perspectives by developing a comparative global anthropology. The subtitle of the project, which is called Overheating, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the metaphor of overheating, because obviously overheating is about accelerated change. Right? In physics, uh, heat and speed are two sides of the same coin. Heat, in fact, is speed in physics. So obviously it is about change, overheating. And it's not just about climate change. Some people just, just see the title uh, think it's just about climate change, and they stop. But climate change is, is part of this. Uh, so um, when we, um, so when we, uh, so what we're going, what we're going to do is uh, overheating. But then, as in so many anthropological monographs, you have a short title and then you have a very long subtitle, which explains what it's about. And the subtitle in this case reads. Um, the Three Crises of Globalization, or An Anthropological History of the Early 21st Century. Nothing less, okay? <laughs> um, of the world in the 21st century. And instead of starting with a macro perspective, as many writers on globalization do, we start from below. So we start with the local ethnographies and try to build up the global uh, anthropology and an understanding of the world by beginning with the, with the local rather than beginning with that uh, which is uh, up there. Uh, this may sound like a trivial thing to you, but uh, I'll try to substantiate the claim that it's not trivial and that it's not easy. But uh, I'm coming back to the substance. The point here is comparison and that you start with local life world. So our, our claim is that if you're going to understand Globalization, you have to understand the people who are both contributing to and affected by processes of globalization. And these people tend to be positioned in a particular site, in a particular place, and in a particular life world, which in many different ways is affected by global processes. And they would also react and respond to these processes in different uh, ways. The, the three crises that we're looking at are the crisis of, I mean, this is kind of party game, okay, I mean, which I've been engaged in for a few years. I mean, all you, I mean, you ask people every day or something, you ask them, you know, if you were to mention three big sort of crises in the world today, which are almost universal in the sense that, that they are being perceived everywhere and they are seen as, you know, problematic everywhere, but in different ways. Which would you mention? 
Um, yeah, well, some say the food crisis, some say uh, water, some say war and peace. And I don't disagree with any of this. I'm, I'm sure that both food, water, and, and war will come into our project <laughs> in different ways. But uh, I would say that one universal tendency is that there are frictions and tensions around identity. Okay. Well, let's call it identity slash culture. Everywhere in the world, I'm not saying that this is, I mean, that something is global doesn't mean that it affects everybody, because it's easy to find exceptions. It's easy to find societies or people who are relatively unaffected by this crisis. So everywhere in the world, there are groups, there are people who uh, negotiate their identities in new ways, and who feel that uh, uh, large-scale processes uh, affect the way they <coughs> articulate their identity. <coughs> I mean, in classic political uh, theory, you have the three options of exit, voice, and loyalty when it comes to identity. Exit, voice, and loyalty, which is a, is a nice starting point for thinking about how people negotiate their identities. Do I embrace global neoliberal capitalism? Uh, do I withdraw into religion or nationalism or alternative communities? Or do I try to voice my concerns? Uh, but remaining within the system, you know, voiced by concerns by forming a trade union or some kind of indigenous rights organization or whatever. You know, that's these are sort of the three options. And permutations thereof. Okay, so um, this is one of the endemic crises of globalization. The second one, I already suggested that much, environment. You know, I somehow prefer to say the environment rather than climate. And, uh, but that's one of the things that we'll be looking at. Um, to what extent do people in given localities around the world perceive the climate crisis as something real and something that they somehow need to respond to? And to what extent do they rather think about their own environment? This, I, I, I can't do anything about the climate, it's too big. You know? I mean, and, and as long as Obama and the Chinese are not in on it, I mean, it's futile, I can't do anything. You know? But this clump of tree or this little street or Arkashaiva, you know, I can maybe do something here. So that's why I prefer environment, because it's a local way of thinking about the global, the global uh, climate um, crisis. Um, and um, I nearly used your loudspeaker as an eraser. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's the second one. And the third one, um, we just had a really good overheating seminar um, a couple of months ago with Gisli Paulson, who's a uh, well-known Icelandic anthropologist, okay? And he's known largely for his work on environmental anthropology. Fisheries, uh, perceptions of nature, that sort of thing. But on one day, I think it must have been in uh, 2008, he realized that uh, he had to shift his interest somewhat because he was stranded at the airport in Copenhagen uh, and didn't know whether he'd get home because he didn't know if Iceland yeah, had gone bankrupt. And he was in the business class lounge, you know, Iceland there, and he saw all these other men, many of them in suits with ashen faces, talking <laughs> frantically on their mobile phones, because that was the day in which Iceland went bankrupt. So Gisli Pausson realized that he had to reorient himself, at least for a while, and try to understand what had happened to his country. Uh, so um, uh, that's the third, <coughs> the third crisis, is economy, finance, which is also endemic. I mean, global new liberal capitalism produces crises. It's, it's very volatile, it's very unpredictable. I mean, financial capitalism is incredibly, because it's, uh, uh, to a great extent, shaped by, by psychological forces. Expectations, hope, that sort of thing. Optimism, pessimism, you know, that kind of thing. So economy, finance, as the third, the main uh, pillar of, um, of overheating. And our assumption is that uh, in all of these three areas, um, there is a real sense in which accelerated change takes place. Change is happening fast. Of course, it's too facile to say that uh, there is fast social change or there is fast cultural change in any given society because uh, if, you, if you start crawling around on all fours with a magnifying glass, you realize very soon that some parts of this society are changing whereas others are not. Or some parts of people's lives are changing, whereas others are surprisingly resilient to change and stable. And so uh, you have to, we have to be specific regarding what kind of changes we're talking about. But our assumption is that in all these realms, we can find instances 
of accelerated change. And not just accelerated change, but accelerated global change. Which in turn, uh, accelerated global change. And, and, and you know, the typical response to this would be something dramatic is happening and nobody asked me for my opinion. And who am I going to blame? And what am I going to do? You know, that's, that's where we're starting, okay? Who am I going to blame? And what am I going to do? It may seem to you that we, we start out with a very negative view of uh, neoliberal um, global capitalism. And perhaps we did. But it's an empirical question whether or not these tendencies are being perceived as offering opportunities or constraints. So um, we have a PhD student who's going to work in Sierra Leone. And he made this point early on when I started on, on my long monologues about crisis. Uh, that by saying that, I mean, yes, in upland Sierra Leone, people do perceive accelerated change. For example, I mean, one thing is this. I mean, in one of the areas that where he's going to do field work, uh, 15 years ago, they didn't have a road. I mean, they had a donkey track. I mean, they had a dirt track, okay? You, 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 most of the year, you needed a four-wheel drive to, to drive there. Now they have a nice paved road. I think it was built by some Chinese, okay? Um, and they already have, tra have traffic jams. Yeah. Uh, that's what I call accelerated change. So yes, there is accelerated change. Or, uh, of course, 10 years ago, I mean, there was, a, there was a terrible civil war in Sierra Leone. I mean, it was really not hanging together at all uh, as, as a country. And, and now there are, there's, a, there's a booming mining business. There's a biofuel plantation that he might be looking at. And uh, you have Chinese uh, investors coming into the country and also quite a few Europeans. So clearly there is accelerated change in the realm of the economy, the environment is being affected by this because um, traditional land is being co-opted for other purposes. Uh, and at the level of identity, you know, who am I? Where am I coming from? Where am I going? Uh, there are dramatic shifts. In the case of Sierra Leone, probably largely at the level of gender and kinship. Okay? Because identity, when you say identity, many people think immediately about ethnic and, and uh, national and religious identities. Need not be the case. Gender identity is a key kind of identity which is changing. In, in many parts of the neoliberal world. And let me give you just one more example of this, of, of the <coughs> sort of how identity is being challenged, but not in the sense of uh, religious, ethnic, national identity. There's another project which unfortunately we haven't got funding for yet, but we're hoping to get funding for it, in Montenegro. Okay? Montenegro, in a part of what used to be called Drunk Yugoslavia, I mean the rest of Yugoslavia, okay, has been an independent country for a few years and is now orienting itself towards Western Europe, politically and economically. And ultimately, I guess like everybody else in that part of the world, they want to be part of the European Union. And this has led to shifts in uh, economic strategies and in, uh, and in the cultural work, which again affects uh, gender identity. Because to put it with a cliche, I mean, we have, a, we have an anthropologist in Montenegro, who is Montenegrin, who tells me this. So this is not just stereotyping from the Protestant North. He says that traditionally Montenegrin men were typically Balkan. In a sense, uh, yeah, what does that tell you? In the sense that they were expected to be strong and silent. They were expected to be strong and silent. And they had uh, ways of working which were compatible with these male ideals. Now increasingly with the changes in, in the economy, they find that, I mean, they have to start working in a different way. Many of them have to sit behind computers in offices. They have to drink coffee with female colleagues. And, they, and some of them may have, may have a woman as a boss. And, and they know that this kind of, this way of working, and they have to learn the art of conversation. Uh, and this way of working, they know will be expected of them if they are going to join the European Union. Uh, so this creates, a, this kind of process creates a crisis in the male identity, the male gender, gender identity. Many men feel that with the coming of the new economy, we are no longer allowed to be men the way we feel we should. Okay? Um, we have echoes of similar debates even in this country, the most gender equitable country in the world. Okay? Even here we have echoes of that debate. Uh, so, uh, so you see the, the point about identity, uh, also, I mean, gender identity being crucial. And in Sierra Leone, probably largely, um, uh, largely, uh, um, uh, gender, and gender and kinship identity are being affected by accelerated change. <coughs> Regarding the environment and climate, um, I don't know if I have to say a lot about this. 
because uh, we all know that uh, there are some uh, fairly serious uh, problems. I mean, I can say problems because I'm a politician, so I don't have to say challenges or opportunities, okay? I can say problems. There are some very serious problems facing us as a species for which we don't really have a solution. I mean, evolution never equipped us with, uh, with an inborn ability to cope with uh, humanly induced environmental disasters. We are equipped with uh, evolutionarily um, evolved um, equipment for dealing with scarcity. So, so the economy, I mean, we know how to sort of make a living, okay? And how to, to um, accumulate a surplus, and how to keep that surplus uh, for leaner days, that sort of thing. We, we have sort of uh, acquired and uh, innate ways of dealing with that, but not with uh, the environmental crisis. There's no formula. And um, what's more is that there's a very clear um, double bind here in our current civilization. Uh, which is evident for everybody who thinks that the environmental, uh, global environmental crisis is serious. Okay? If you don't believe it's serious, then there's no worry. I mean, then you can just talk about distribution and poverty and, uh, and that sort of thing. But if you think that this is serious, there's a very clear double bind in the sense that you can't have it both ways. You can't have both uh, growth, economic growth, and at the same time uh, think that you, you're looking after the environment in a responsible way. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental dilemma, the way I see it anyway. Everybody does have to see it that way. So uh, economy finance, as I said, yes, it, it, I mean, it, it goes up and down in very, very often in unpredictable ways. Nobody knows. I mean, uh, what's going to happen in, say, five years? So uh, I hear that uh, in the private sector, until a few years ago, it was quite common to distinguish between short-term and long-term planning. And that distinction has now collapsed because uh, nobody knows what's going to happen in the long term. I mean, uh, I mean, just, just, I mean, just think about it. Think about the, the, you know, what's happening in the, mobile, the world of mobile phones, the world of really sort of income generating uh, businesses. Um, Nokia, which was an interesting case. Uh, we wrote about that. I mean, my, my friend Doug Heston, who's a biologist, and I wrote a book about competition that came out last year called Clear, the Motor Paradox, the Treadmill Paradox which is about the particular form of, uh, of competition which leads to overheating. Namely, the form of competition whereby you have to move really fast in order to stay in the same place. You have to evolve all the time because everybody else does, you know? So our starting point, I mean, I, I'm not giving that lecture now, but just, just one anecdote from that book because it feeds into overheating, in a, I think, in a nice way. Why do the trees outside of Oslo, in Nord, Michael, why do the trees have to be 30 meters tall? I mean, why couldn't they just be 4 or 5 meters tall? Well, the simple explanation is that, well, you have to be 30 meters tall because the trees next to you are 28 meters. So in order to get enough sunlight to produce uh, enough seeds, you see, to reproduce yourself, you have to be that tall. So the next generation of trees will be maybe 30 and a half, you know, because those genes will be selected for, uh, that produce tall trees. So, and then the next, next question is, and this is where anthropology comes in, you know, why can't those trees just come together, I mean, and have a meeting, and decide that, <laughs> as from next year, we're only going to be four meters tall, and then we'll spend the rest of our energy doing something nice. Okay? Uh, well, the short answer is, uh, trees can't do that, but humans can. Human beings can. We can actually get together. And this is where we may um, become normative in some of our research in dealing with the relationship between the environment and the economy. We can, in fact, get together and decide that next year we're only going to be four meters tall. And um, bollocks to uh, a prime minister who, you know, who, who is first and foremost an economist and not uh, and not a politician, uh, and uh, and a certain way of thinking about values. You know, we can you can you can uh, develop an argument um, around that. So um, so that's the. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the treadmill paradox. But what I was going to say about Nokia in this context, just to illustrate the, and the fundamental unpredictability, not just of finance, but of the economy in general, is that when the first uh, telephones appeared with a touchscreen, okay, uh, that was, I think, in the autumn of 2009, uh, the central sort of <coughs> design and planning facilities of Nokia, which was then the world leader in the world of mobile phones, I mean, that's something like 60% of the global market, it was an enormous generator of foreign exchange and income for Finland and employment worldwide. Thousands of people were working just in Nokia's chapter in, in, in Copenhagen, you know, in their little office in Copenhagen. So it was huge. 
Uh, and then the uh, people in the central design and planning department in Nokia decided that um, this is just a passing fad. We'll stick to our sort of the sort of the, the keyboard. You remember those? I mean, phones that we had a little keyboard that you could pull out, you know. And we'll stick to those and to our other wonderful models, and the world will continue to love those phones. But they only, they only stayed asleep for maybe three or four months. But by the time they woke up and realized that we have to make telephones with touch screens as well, and we have to do it really fast. By that time, the market had already nearly been taken over by competitors, and not just Apple, but Samsung and LG were also really quick, you know, on the trigger to, to develop their own uh, touchscreen phones. And Nokia never recovered. I mean, they never managed to return. This, it's a fascinating story about how a market leader can just uh, disappear. Something similar happened to IBM in the world of portable computing in the 1980s. IBM was when, when Axel and I were students. I mean, everybody dreamed about an uh, IBM computer. You know, that was <laughs> the best you could get, you know, <laughs> because they were a market leader. And after four or five, six years, I mean, we never heard anything from IBM again. I mean, at least not in that world of, of portable computing. So this, so this is it's volatile, and it, uh, it changes quickly, and it even, and it even disrupts some of our research plans, because uh, uh, to give you an illustration of how these things uh, work together, uh, I'll very briefly outline some of the places we're going to later on, but, and, but, and I'll begin with myself, okay? Because that's the one I know the most about, at least the place where I was intending to go. But things change so fast in this accelerated <laughs> world that my field disappeared before it even got started, and before I got on the plane, you see? And the field was no longer there, so I had to reorient myself. Um, and it's interesting because we spoke a little bit about similar things over lunch. Uh, Australia um, looks like this. Most of the people live down here, right? And there are a few people elsewhere. This particular corner of Australia is called the Kimberley. And it's, it's very remote. You know, the district capital of Western Australia, I mean, the western third of Australia is just one state, very thinly populated. The, the, the district capital is Perth, which is down here. So it's se several hours flight. I mean, Jakarta is nearer, okay? Mm -hmm. Dili, then Pasar. I mean, there are cities in East Timor and Indonesia which are far nearer than, uh, than the district capital. And the capital of Australia itself, of course, is very far away. So this is a very remote area, but it's rich in natural resources. Uh, there is natural gas, okay? And there are operations drilling natural gas in the uh, sort of Browse Basin outside of uh, the Kimberley. Um, there was a project which was projected and planned for several years to build a gas hub on the Kimberley coast. There's just one town of any size in the Kimberley called Broome, which is here. And of any size, I mean, um, well, it's the size of Herbefoss, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, you could compare it to Herbefoss, okay? About 10,000 10, people, a rural town, sort of, where people come in with their cowboy boots and their hats and, <laughs> and, and, and ask for a beer, you know, it's that kind of place. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, and the room is known for several things, among, other, among others, the, the, the fantastic scenery. I mean, it's, it, it's seen, uh, the, the Kimberley is seen as one of the last, one of the world's last unspoilt wildernesses, as they say. And it's really wide. I mean, there are very few people living there. About a third of the population are Aboriginal, uh, and the remaining two-thirds are itinerant. I mean, some of the miners, some of them work there for a few years, but then they can't stand, you know, the loneliness of room and go back to, to Melbourne or Sydney or where they're from. So there's a lot of sort of flux in the, uh, in the white population, whereas the Aborigines have been there forever, maybe for 40,000 years. Yeah. They are, I mean, Aborigines have a very long history in this part of Australia. And uh, so they we're planning to build a gas hub, which is a major industrial uh, installation, aim to, to get all the natural gas, the, the liquid natural gas, in from these fields and to refine and store it. So it was a storage and distribution facility for liquid natural uh, gas. Uh, there were lots of protests against it. And some people were in favour. People were generally ambivalent. And this is one of the interesting things about the crisis of globalisation and the changes taking place everywhere, is the ambivalence, I think. That people are undecided. It's not easy for, it wasn't easy for people in Broome to state whether they were in favour of, the, uh, of, the, of the, 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 uh, the gas hub or against it. But most of them, in the end, were against the gas hub, most of the people in Broome. Whereas Aborigines were divided. Some of them saw opportunities. I mean, uh, they would get quite a bit of money for this because it was on their land. And the Australian Aborigines now finally have native titles, so they have, so they have, they have real right, they have real ownership. To, to land. So it would release money. It would create uh, jobs for their uh, husbands and uh, 
the um, gas company also promised to build new roads and a health station and new schools and lots of opportunities. Even they would even expand probably the the, uh, the tiny airport, tiny Broome airport, would probably be expanded with an international terminal, so they could go directly on holiday to Bali without going via Perth. Mm. You know, uh, so uh, I mean, there were there were all these things, and they would get a lot of attention from outside. It would generate wealth. If an elderly couple who had bought their house in Broome and paid twenty thousand dollars, say twenty years ago, they, they might now they might now sell it for half a million dollars. You know, and, and the retire on the Gold Coast, I mean, Australia's equivalent to Florida. So, um, so you have these, uh, uh, these considerations. But the other story from the Aborigines was that it's impossible to build a gas hub there because it would be tantamount to burning a library. Because uh, we Aborigines have an oral culture and our cultural memory is, asso is associated with place. I mean, I mean, everybody knows this, you know, I mean, there's a very sort of well-known fact about Australian Aborigines, the, how they orient themselves in landscape and how they attach significance to features in the landscape, right? And they have song lines, which are invisible parts, which meander through the landscape and which helps them to remember uh, mythical stories and also stories about real-time events that have taken place. So they said, if this coastline is being disrupted by that ugly structure, we're going to lose our cultural memory. And we, we might as well, I mean, uh, throw in the towel. We lost as a people. So you had all these discussions. And the environmentalists were against it, but the politicians were in favor of it. And, um, and so on. So um, and this went on for a long time. And my aim was to go there and to study all these discourses, all these tensions, frictions, conflicts, and try to find out what they said about processes of globalization and these three crises, which I think of, um, I mean, as, a, as an old-fashioned anthropologist, OK? Uh, Pre-postmodern anthropologist. Um, as a man of the 20th century, I think of these three crises as crises of reproduction. Crisis of reproduction. That is to say, we are no longer capable of reproducing ourselves the way we wish we could. Not in an identical way, but we want to change on our own terms. If we want to change, we want to make the decision ourselves. Whereas the feeling is now that uh, change is coming from outside. And that uh, everybody is telling us, Tina, there is no alternative. And that was Maggie Thatcher's take on, uh, on globalization. Uh, and, uh, and what are we going to do? Should we resist? You know, should we rejoice in it, etc.? So um, people had this, uh, they, they had the, it's, the, many, many felt this crisis of reproduction. So I was going to explore this, but not just the crisis, but also the other side you know, of the story, the opportunities, the people who might benefit, at least in the short term. from changes. But then, people who benefit from, or seem to benefit from changes in the short term don't necessarily benefit in the long term. And we have many stories about that as well, about the unintentional long-term consequences <coughs> of change. But anyway, it's going to do this. And look at all these groups, you know, and how they were sort of dealing with each other, and how they were framing the problem. I mean, you even had some conservationists from down in Melbourne who had discovered that it was a rare species of dolphin, you know, <laughs> which had its breeding grounds just outside. Uh, where they were going to build the gas hub. And another uh, researcher, another natural scientist from Sydney, had discovered some very rare dinosaur footprints. Okay, there are dinosaur footprints there. How can you destroy this? I mean, they're millions of years old, that's all. Uh, so uh, we had all these arguments. And I was really looking forward to going down there, beginning to get in touch, beginning to apply for a, an ethical permit from the Kimberley Land Council, which is the leading Aboriginal association. And then you had, in order to apply for this, it's a big job. I spent two evenings doing it. Uh, to, to fill in the form, because you have to explain to them how your research is going to benefit the community. Because Australian Aborigines have had a lot of anthropologists who have come in, taken out knowledge, and built a career on it without giving anything back. Mm -hmm. And finally they've learned. So that was one of the questions. How are you going to give back to the community? How is this going to benefit us? Uh, and I really had to think very hard, you know? Oh, I have to phrase that. And secondly, how big is your budget for informants, for paying informants? You know, because for them, it's a job. Working, to work for anthropologists, it's a job. They take their time. I mean, they take hours of their time talking to you, and you should pay them for it. Uh, you know, it's a new way of thinking, okay? But that's how uh, many Australian Aboriginal organizations now work. So I done all this, sent off the application, and then came the news, a little more than a month ago, that the entire project had been scrapped. It had been abandoned. <laughs> it's all coming about. They're not building the gas hub. So, um, and interestingly, 
in the space of just a week, I got the feeling, I mean, only by following things on the internet and emailing with people I know and so on in, in the area, that there was a sense of disappointment. Even people had been against it, who had, who had, who had demonstrated it with, with these angry placards and so on against the West Australian government, they were slightly disappointed because they had got all this attention from outside, all this interest, and this morally justifiable engagement. So many of them were secretly looking forward to the gas hub being built um, so that they could take the moral high ground and be against it while reaping all the benefits. <laughs> new road, new international terminal, I mean, lots of money, people coming in to visit them, a lot of attention from the outside, and so on. So this ambivalence, fundamental. I'm not saying that those 89% who were against it are now suddenly disappointed, but that there was a sense of disappointment, because now Broome is just a backwater, where nothing's happening, where the accelerated change of overheating has turned to deceleration. It's become very slow. And there's only one thing worse than everybody in Norway knows it. There's only one thing worse than overheating, and that's overcooling. When <laughs> <laughs> things get too cold, I mean, a new ice age would be even worse, you know, than a, than a slightly hotter world in some ways. So, uh, so it, it became, it, it decelerated. Things began to move really, really slowly. So I had to reorient myself and find a new field site, and I did find one. On the other side of Australia, in, uh, in Queensland, I'm not going to say more about that now, where many of the same contradictions play themselves out, but in a more, you might say, in a messier and more complex environment, where it, where it may be more difficult to, uh, to see the main lines of contention. So crisis of reproduction. Um, the other projects, I'm going, to, I'm going to say a little bit about methodology also, how we're going to work with this. But uh, I'll just very briefly mention the other projects that we have. Uh, there's one in uh, northern Alberta in Canada, in association, in connection with the tar sand uh, um, exploration and uh, uh, the tar sand works uh, there, uh, mining, uh, where several groups are being affected in various ways. I mean, you have uh, First Nations, as they call them in, uh, in Australia, in, in, in Canada, uh, but there are also some old white Canadian communities in, in the far north who traditionally have lived by trapping, for example, hunting, trapping, that sort of thing. Uh, kind of white redneck community, which is also something. I mean, you wake up one morning and there are 2,000 Chinese living just across the river. And you wonder who put them there and what they're doing there. And why did nobody ask me? You know, I mean, uh, because you can see the point. Accelerated change without, without consulting me. And my livelihood is going away. And obviously, of course, Jens Stoltenberg and Helge Lund can deny that there is such a thing as man-made climate change. But they cannot deny the fact. I mean, that's... Uh, Certain forms of cancer have, have gone up by like a thousand percent in Fort McMurray, okay? And that a very large number of fish are now born with two heads in those rivers. And it didn't used to be the case 10, 15 years ago. And they can't deny that because this, is, uh, this can be proven. And like man-made climate change, we can always say, oh, the scientists disagree, you know, so we just go on with business as usual. You can't do that with uh, two-headed fish and with uh, the tenfold increase in, uh, in, in cancer. Uh, so, uh, so she's going, she's going up there, and, uh, and, and we insist, we insist that, or I insist, that everybody is going to give everybody a fair hearing. You see, so that we, uh, we insist on studying four different groups in every community where we go, every place where we go, four different groups. And the wonderful thing about contemporary globalization is that this kind of comparative anthropology is now finally possible, because you can find comparable groups in, in, in all countries in the world, precisely because of globalization. So you, there are NGOs everywhere. NGOs who are part of a kind of transnational NGO discourse, who use many of the same terms, who invoke human rights, for example. Um, so we, we are to look at NGOs, people with an above average interest in, uh, in one or all of these crises. Those would be, you know, Anat Singh's uh, Indonesian activists, you know, typical sort of NGO uh, people. From Anat Singh's book, Friction, which one of the um, one of the nicest books uh, written about globalization by an anthropologist. <coughs> in recent years, uh, NGOs, then we're going to look at and uh, talk to decision makers, either political or economic decision makers. The point there is that these are people who take decisions with consequences for many people whom they do not know personally. People they don't know personally. Okay, they have to take those decisions. So in the, in the case of Northern Canada, it may be Statoil executives, or or people in the uh, district government, or the state government of, of Alberta. Or even local politicians in Fort McMurray. Um, and then the two other groups are ordinary citizens, middle class and poor. Middle class and poor. Okay. 
which are rough categories. But we know who they are when we see them. And in, um, in Australia and, and Canada, uh, poor people tend to be indigenous. Not always, but they tend to be indigenous. And they would have different takes on it. They would have different perceptions, different interpretations, and different views on what should be done. And, uh, and uh, a bit different views of the, of the future. So typically, uh, we're going to ask some of the same questions to comparable people. For example, ask a 70-year-old uh, unemployed man what he thinks about the future. Everybody should do that. What do you think about the future? Uh, what was the past like to, to position themselves? Um, is this investment a good or a bad thing? Why? So in, in this way, by asking many of the same precise questions uh, to our material and using some of the same concepts, uh, we can develop uh, comparative anthropology because we can actually develop ethnographic material which is comparable across, across continents. So quite unlike what some anthropologists have felt, especially in the mid to late 20th century, namely that the loss of primitive society was a disaster for anthropology. You know, because we lost the radical other. I mean, some people are trying to regain them. Um, I'm not sure what I think about that. Um, but the, the general feeling is that of a loss of a certain kind of cultural diversity. Claude Lévi-Strauss, the great French anthropologist, wrote about this already in the 1950s, in his book Tristopique, about how everything was now becoming colonized by modernity, and so on. So quite the opposite of this view uh, is, uh, is our perception of what the world is like, where we are saying that, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the very fact that we now have a global conversation, we have a global conversation about these things, and some other things, um, gives us new and vastly improved possible opportunities for global comparisons, because we can identify comparable groups. There is some comparable research along those lines. I mean, there's a, there's a small, small but growing body of McDonald's research, for example, <coughs> research on McDonald's restaurants. You know, they, physically they're exactly the same, but they mean very different things to different people, because nothing has a meaning in itself. It only has a meaning to which it is attributed, and people attribute different meanings to the same things in different places. So, there, I mean, there is some, but not that much. And, nothing, and I don't think there's anything as big as this, okay? Yeah. Uh, all right, that was Northern Canada. The second project, in Highland Peru, it has a focus on, uh, on water. Uh, it's southern Peru, where water is scarce resource, where there have been irrigation canals since well before uh, the conquest, the European conquest, okay? I mean, part of the, uh, of the Inca Empire, and before that, part of several other early uh, South American states. So they have very old uh, irrigation canals and very old practices of distributing water. Now, of course, high up, in a dry area, there's a lot of water, and that's less the further down you get. And on the fertile plains, where they, where they have a considerable agriculture, they're totally dependent on, on the irrigation, because there's no rain. We're talking here about, I mean, the outskirts of the Atacama Desert, you know, one of the driest places on the planet. Water is now being privatized, and that's part of the, you know, the problematic that we're looking at. It's partly being privatized. And what are the consequences? when something that used to be a commons, it used to belong to everybody, in a collective way, is being individualized. What are the consequences? You know, that's one of the questions that we're raising here. And how do people perceive the changes? When suddenly, I mean, uh, there's a lot of water, but in the wrong places and at the wrong times of the year, because the tropical glaciers are melting. And this also, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, you can't deny it, it's happening. Tropical glaciers are melting, much faster than they used to. And they will be gone, maybe in our lifetime. Then uh, the Andean glaciers will be gone, and then uh, the plains are going to be very dry, and so uh, yeah. And people, uh, you know, have a, a local local discourses about what the causes are. Many people talk about the Chinese. It's because of the Chinese, you know, because they burn up so much coal. I mean, they've heard about this. Um, whereas others would have more, you know, cosmological explanations for why there is uh, water at the wrong times of the year. Anyway, that's the second side. The third site, which I already mentioned briefly, is Upland, Sierra Leone. So here we have one OECD country, okay, that's Canada, one semi-peripheral country, as I call it, semi-peripheral, uh, in accordance with old-fashioned uh, world system theory, uh, semi-peripheral, that's Peru, and one really peripheral country, okay, which is Sierra Leone, which is a state which uh, barely hangs together, where the central government is far away, even if it's only a few miles, you know, from, even if you're only a few 
free miles from Freetown, so that if anybody feels that, uh, if some of the private companies feel that they need a road, they have to build it themselves. At least that's what they say. So that's the, um, the, 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 the third site. And one interesting thing about Sierra Leone, uh, according to my PhD student, who's been there quite a few times, and he knows the country quite well um, already, is that uh, there's a general lack of trust. That people don't really trust anyone. I mean, all the hope he says. I mean, and, and he wonders sort of what are the, what's the glue of this society where people are so distrusting. And partly it's because of individualization, and partly it's because of the experiences of the war. I mean, at least that would be you know, part of the framework for understanding this uh, relative lack of trust. But the individualization taking place in Sierra Leone also leads to several crises of, of reproduction because uh, uh, land rights, which used to be customary, land used to be held uh, collectively, just like water in Peru. It was owned by the community. It's now being indiv individualized so that people can actually own a plot of land as, as an individual and have a title deed you know, to a plot of land. And this has consequences for local organization, for reciprocity, you know, for basically for the glue of society. So that's the... Uh, <laughs> the third and the oh, spoke. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll be winding up in a little while. Yeah, uh, and the fourth side we've got is uh, a brick. Okay, you have brick. You have uh, OECD, semi-periphery, periphery, and brick. Okay, uh, uh, which is uh, the Philippines. An up and coming industrial, yeah, Axel knows this really well. I mean, uh, I didn't know it as a You did know it uh, <laughs> some time ago, yeah. Uh, but you know, you've known so many places. But she's going to Subic Bay. Um, which is a special place in the, in the Filipino history. I mean, because Subic Bay was where the Americans had a naval base for the military base for, for many years. And it was closed down in the early 1990s and left behind sort of urban debris. I mean, of, uh, of uh, ramshackle uh, brothels, bars, you know, uh, a string of shops which now hardly have any customers anymore. And, and, and a number of army veterans who hanged on because they'd spent so much time there and, and had good memories, you know, of the, of the time in Subic Bay. Subic Bay is now being redeveloped transnationally by the South Koreans who are building a, a, a shipyard. Well, they built a shipyard, actually, it's, there. it's quite new. Hanjin, which is one of the main Korean uh, shipbuilding companies. And as I told Elizabeth, I mean, uh, before I hired her, I mean, I have a personal connection to this, you see, because I grew up in a town called Tunspey, which is about 100 kilometers south of Oslo. And in Tunsberg, there was one sort of cornerstone uh, employer in the, uh, in the town, and that was called Ness Meklashner, which was a, a, ship, a shipyard, okay? a big shipyard, which employed a couple of thousand people. I mean, it was, it was seriously important for the economy of the, uh, uh, of the place. Uh, and it was slowly closed down. I mean, they tried to sort of do other things than building huge ships. I mean, for a period, I mean, it was just closed down. And that's now been, I think, rebuilt as expensive flats and that sort of thing along on the seaside. Uh, sort of through a form of gentrification, and lots of people were laid off. And the reason it was closed down was that they lost out with, uh, to competition with the Koreans, because the Koreans could deliver the same ships, you see, much more cheaply than the Norwegians. And now the Koreans are losing out, it seems, to the Filipinos, because in the Philippines you now still have uh, non-organized, abundant, cheap labor, which you no longer have in South Korea, where there has been a lot of labor unrest strikes, because they've reached a level where they can actually uh, demand their rights. So Elizabeth is looking into this, the connection of South Korea in, uh, and the Philippines, with a particular emphasis on what's going on in, in Subic Bay, where we also see these crises. I mean, there's a lot of environmental consequences and, uh, and so on, uh, playing themselves out. And, um, and finally, I'm going to, um, to Australia. So we have just one part, kind of country that we should have had, but which we didn't get in the first round. And that's the so-called Muslim world. You know? uh, I'm saying so-called because Indonesia and Morocco don't have necessarily a lot in common. But there is something about a public discourse about global crisis in most Muslim countries which is slightly different from what you get elsewhere. I'm not saying that they're all the same. Iran is very different from the Emirates. But there is something about the Muslim way. You can talk about the family of Muslim ways of approaching global crisis and positioning oneself because one has been used to seeing oneself as a victim of globalization. You know. It's something American, and it's generally bad news for us, particularly if you're religious, because it's, uh, it's secular and individualist and, and a lot of other things. And this Muslim world, could, could, it could be Dubai, but it could also be Indonesia or Xinjiang. Um, the point is that we, we need that. So we're looking for that person now. Okay? Uh, and we have, we've got the, all right, the job was advertised today. Is this coming on YouTube?
<laughs> uh, getting hundreds of applicants. Uh, uh, Muslim world or South Asia, or South Asia. I mean, India, that sort of place, which I feel it would also be interesting to have uh, in this context. So what we're doing is now that everybody will be going on feedback at the same time, uh, equipped with a number of shared questions, both general questions and more specific questions of the kind that I, that I mentioned, and will be in contact, uh, technology allowing, uh, during feedback. When I say technology allowing it is because I know that the, the internet connection can be patchy in places. I mean, in Highland Peru, you know, I mean, in, if you're on the wrong side of, of a certain mountain, you don't, get, you, you don't get the mobile connection. And similarly, in upland uh, Sierra Leone, I mean, it comes and goes a bit. But we, we will be in contact and we'll be coordinating many of our research questions as we go along in order to be able to produce a comparable, a comparable ethnographies. There is one, I, I'm, I'm ending now, but just to give you a, an idea of where, where I hope that we go, we'll be going. We'll be doing this for four to five years. I got five years, the others have four each. And uh, obviously we'll produce the usual things, such as, I mean, academic articles, edited volumes, we'll have conferences, workshops, and so on. But we'll also try to, uh, to think in other ways about the dissemination of our findings, because you have this material, and it can be used for lots of different things. Maybe some of it can be used for a documentary <coughs> film. Maybe some of it can be used for a very different kind of book. Um, or a different kind of, of writing, or maybe for a YouTube lecture, a kind of sort of TED Talk lecture. I mean, the overheating series of TED Talk lectures, you know, that's sort of thing. We, I mean, why not? We have to think along those lines about the way we use our material, because the academic channels are not enough if you want to have an impact, if you want to be Thomas Friedman. Um, which we don't, but if, you <laughs> but, if you want to, but if you want to be able to correct Thomas Friedman somewhere else and in a seminar room, uh, you need to um, you need to think uh, differently about dissemination. Uh, so that's um, that's one thing. Uh, but another thing I'd like to mention right at the end is that, in fact, there is a model for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And you can say if you said I mean Axenos and other people are in anthropology would know what I'm talking about. And I'm saying that what we try to do is to write an, an Eric Wolf for the 21st century. Okay, because Eric Wolf was an anthropologist who wrote a book called Europe and the People Without History back in 1982. And oddly enough, it was probably the first major research-based book which saw the colonizing process, the process of conquest from the viewpoint of the conquered peoples, of the colonized peoples. Uh, and uh, so, in other words, it was a global anthropology of colonization seen from below. Seen from, I mean, he tried to find out how, they, how, they, how people in, in the Caribbean, how they must have perceived those Spaniards and what they did about them. And this is what we're going to do with the globalization. How do people who live in particular communities uh, perceive and relate to, uh, to globalization? All right. So, Fantastic. Uh, on that note, I end. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll open up for comments and questions. Uh, please identify uh, yourselves.